Greetings, class, and welcome to the first breakdown of 2023. I am your professor, Cygnus Jason, and today we shall be exploring the ins and outs of Hogwarts Legacy. Before we dive in, allow me to preface this lesson by saying, I am not a Harry Potter fan, per se. More specifically, I've seen small bits of the movies here and there, and I have read exactly zero of the books, so don't look at me to elaborate on the backstory or lore or whatever. With that out of the way, let's get started by taking a look at the developer, Avalanche. No, not that Avalanche. Avalanche Software. Founded in 1995, Avalanche Software is a subsidiary of Warner Brothers Games, and they've got a colorful history of games across damn near every console. Rugrats, Prince of Persia, the TAC series, Hannah Montana, Chicken Little, and many others. Before there was Avalanche Software, there were four programmers who worked for a developer called Sculptured Software. After Sculptured was acquired by Acclaim Entertainment, the four programmers were looking to join another developer called Sapphire, a developer which was seeking programmers for an upcoming project. The four programmers did not want to commute 45 minutes to Sapphire, so after discussing this with the owner of Sapphire, he convinced the four programmers to start their own company. Thus, Avalanche Software was born, with one of the programmers, John Blackburn, as company president. In April 2005, Buena Vista Games, the game publishing side of the Walt Disney Company, acquired Avalanche. In January 2013, Avalanche announced Disney Infinity, which basically had you use amiibos, for lack of a better term, of Disney characters in tandem with the game itself. This placed Disney Infinity into the Toys to Life genre of games, which I did not know was a thing, and has been a thing since 1987. Anyway, due to increasing development costs and profits not looking too great, Disney pulled the plug on Disney Infinity, Buena Vista Games, and, by extension, Avalanche Software. In January of 2017, Warner Brothers Interactive Entertainment had acquired and resurrected Avalanche Software, with John Blackburn returning as CEO. Finally, in September 2020, Hogwarts Legacy was announced at the PlayStation 5 event and released on February 10th, 2023. It's not hard to make the case that Hogwarts Legacy is the best thing to come out of Avalanche software, and it's about time I told you why. Usually, I start off with a story synopsis, but the prologue of the game is done so well that I don't want to spoil anything for any of you that plan on playing it. To summarize the story in one sentence, some bad people want you dead, but they'll have to wait, because it's a school night. As you probably already know, Hogwarts Legacy is an open world game. Between your classes at Hogwarts and your extracurricular exercises elsewhere, you will take part in all kinds of activities, both for yourself and for others. Unlike in Harry Potter, where going out after dark gets you eaten by a giant snake and you spend the rest of eternity as a wailing ghost in a girl's bathroom stall, you're pretty much free to do whatever at any given time of day in Hogwarts Legacy. Basically, once you create your character, go through the prologue, get sorted into a house, attend the first few classes to learn some basic spells, and visit Hogsmeade to pick up school supplies and select your wand, you are set free, as it were. While at Hogwarts, you can attend classes to learn new spells, take on different side quests for students or faculty alike, take part in competitive games against other students, or explore the school grounds in search of field guide pages, secret rooms, treasure chests, or other collectibles. While you're away from Hogwarts and exploring the world, this is when the freedom to do whatever almost swallows you whole. You can visit any of the fictional towns that dot the beautiful Scottish Highlands and look for trouble to get into. Most of the NPCs you can talk to or interact with are memorable. Is someone there? While the characters are diverse, the dialogue options are not. Anytime you're given a choice between one dialogue option or another, it doesn't really influence the final outcome of the conversation. In some cases, you can squeeze people for a slightly larger quest reward. Unless you want your classmates to know how you really feel about them, you might reward me for my time. Oh. Or keep someone's important possession that they specifically sent you to go find, but it's nothing that you can't live without. Out in the wilds, there are puzzles to solve, potion crafting materials to collect, caves to explore, enemy camps to dismantle, Release me! monsters to fight along with the occasional infamous foe to really test your mettle, or, my personal favorite, dark arts dueling arenas. Best part is, that's only the tip of the iceberg. The various activities all reward you with just about anything you could need for any part of your gameplay experience, be it XP, necessary galleons to buy something, clothing styles to keep your wardrobe fresh, 
ingredients to make potions for class or for combat, and so on. Every part of this game is absolute fun, and nothing feels like an annoying chore. Some activities or locales may be level gated, but you will never feel like you have to farm for XP or anything else just to advance the story. It all progresses at a natural pace. At least, it does for me, since I chose to play on normal difficulty and enjoy myself. And enjoying myself, I am. I got this game for two reasons. One, I needed something different to play because blood and bullets is fun, but you need a palate cleanse every now and again. Two, because I wanted to see how close the game would let me get to being a psychopath. Or, in other words, how far removed can I get from the goody two-shoes nature of 90% of the people at Hogwarts. Unfortunately, the voice of my character still makes him sound relatively nice, even if he's not actively trying to be. His feet were turned into purple beets. You can imagine his distress. And mine. I won't even go into the attention he was getting from our garden rabbits before he admitted himself to hospital. Beats for feet. <laughs> how hilarious. I mean, how, how terrible. But I think that makes it all the more satisfying when I, a 15-year-old school student, unleash generous amounts of lethal sorcery to nuke grown adults on a daily basis. There may not be blood shooting out of my victims, but I don't need to see blood when I cook someone with a lightning bolt. The flow of combat in Hogwarts Legacy is smooth as hell. First, you have a basic four-shot combo that you get cozy with during the prologue, as it's your most reliable form of attack and only gets better through talents, which we'll get to in a bit. The spells you learn fall into six distinct categories. Control spells, force spells, damage spells, utility spells, transfiguration spells, and unforgivable curses. There are also situational spells under the heading of essential, so I guess that's technically a seventh category. Pretty much all spells outside of the utility and transfiguration categories have use both in and out of combat situations. The control spell, Levioso, for example, can be used to lift obstacles and puzzle items or lift an enemy into the air, leaving them vulnerable. A force spell, like Accio, can be used to drag objects around or yank a far off enemy towards you. A damage spell like Incendio can be used to light torches in a dark cave or turn nearby enemies to ashes. Certain actions in combat build the Ancient Magic Meter, which allows you to perform Ancient Magic attacks that deal a shit ton of damage, usually enough to outright kill normal enemies. I say usually because enemies just above your level are a bit harder to kill, but your skill as a player can overcome the level gap more often than not. Enemies far above your level, however, take very little damage and are able to stomp you out with ease. All non-essential spells have a cooldown time, and while you're waiting for them to recharge, you should be scanning the area for items to hurl at enemies, or casting Pratigo to shield yourself and counter with Stupefy in order to stun your attacker for a brief period. Enemies can also have shields, color-coded to represent what category of spell must be used to break through the shield and damage them. If you don't happen to have the necessary spell equipped on any of your spell loadouts, curses and ancient magic attacks can shred shields quite readily. The game isn't really kidding about the unforgivable part of unforgivable curses, so you may want to refrain from casting a curse in plain view of just anybody. Unforgivable curses are so named for a reason. If I hear that either of you continues down this path, if either of you uses dark magic, I will notify the headmaster immediately. To further improve the deadliness of your spells are talents, which unlock from a main story quest, but begin accumulating every level after level 5. Talents are split into 5 categories, spells, dark arts, core, stealth, and room of requirement. Spells and dark arts talents make your spells more dangerous by increasing the number of targets affected or adding additional damaging effects. Core talents can increase the effectiveness of your essential spells or how many spell trays you have to use essentially increasing the amount of spells you can have ready at any given time. Stealth talents do exactly what you think they do, and Room of Requirement talents make your brewed potions or plant consumables much more useful. Talents that are for a specific spell require you to learn that spell before unlocking, and the game makes it clear that you will not be able to unlock absolutely every talent, so you should carefully choose which ones will be the most useful to your playstyle. Having the levels and spells are a good start, but you're going to need gear to be fully effective in combat. You have 6 slots for gear, and each piece increases your 3 main stats, health, defense, and offense. Gear can have trait slots, which house traits that give you bonuses to certain spells or advantages against certain types of enemies. Some gear pieces come with traits already slotted, and others will require you to visit the enchanted loom in your room of requirement in order to slot in a trait yourself. 
Finding gear pieces means that you now have that piece's appearance saved and you are able to freely change the appearance of your gear at any time, ensuring you will always be equal parts dangerous and stylish. Gear styles can also be rewarded through challenges, which will ask you to gather certain collectibles, kill specific enemies, or finish certain quest types, but they are super easy and barely an inconvenience. You can only hold so many pieces of actual gear, so be sure to destroy or sell off whatever you're not using at a vendor, and also complete Merlin trials in order to increase your inventory size and hold more gear. Some gear pieces may be unidentified when you first find them, and cannot be equipped as is. These pieces must be revealed at the desk of description in your room of requirement in order to use them. Now, let's say you slip up during combat and come close to death, or come in contact with enemies way stronger than you. There are a few ways to make it out alive. Wiganweld potions are your primary method of healing. They, much like any other potion, can be bought from a vendor, found in the wild, or brewed at any potions table, with ingredients you can buy from a vendor, find in the wild, or grow in any herbology table. Wiganweld potions have their own dedicated hotkey and other potions or consumables are accessible via the item wheel. Other potions include invisibility potions to give you a few seconds to escape from sight, endurance potions which boost your defense for a bit, and others. There are also fun items like the mandrake plant whose violent screams disrupt all nearby enemies and stun them for a bit. If all else fails, just run away from the fight. It'll save you potions since your HP will gradually replenish once you are officially out of combat. All in all, after your first few hours of playtime, you'll be equipped to handle or escape from pretty much any combat situation. A big part of Hogwarts Legacy is exploration. The world map shows you how absolutely massive the playable area is, along with notes of how many collectibles are still present in a region, and what level of enemies you can expect to encounter. An explorer's best friend is their selection of utility spells. Lumos can light your path or see use in certain puzzles. Disillusionment can allow you to sneak around others virtually undetected, and Reparo can fix broken pathways or mechanisms. On some occasions, Force Spells and Control Spells will also come in handy. Early on in the game, you'll need to run from place to place. Fast travel points are unlocked simply by walking near them, and obviously that makes traveling much easier. Once you unlock flight options, such as your broom or a flying mount, the world really opens up. Points of interest are marked all along the map, as you'd expect them to be in any open world game, and they mark everything, from puzzles to enemy strongholds to fast travel points that you can unlock. Pathfinding for quest objectives is almost always available at the tap of a button, with some quests requiring you to follow a map from your inventory or use the essential spell Revelio to highlight interactable items. Revelio is also great for highlighting collectibles to grab or a treasure chest to loot. You'll most often find galleons or clothing items when you loot containers. Some buildings or containers will require Alohomora in order to pick the lock, but this does not become available until after the main quest called Professor Rackham's Trial. Oh, I almost forgot about the room of requirement. After a handful of main story quests, Professor Weasley will accompany you into a secret room called the Room of Requirement, which takes the shape of and contains within itself exactly what is desired by whoever finds the room. In this case, it takes the shape of your own personal room that you can modify or decorate however you want using the transfiguration spells that Professor Weasley teaches you. You can modify architecture, the size of the decorations you place, and even make improved crafting stations for potion brewing or plant growing. As mentioned earlier, this room also allows you to use the desk of description to identify any unidentified gear pieces you find, as well as socket traits or upgrade gear pieces at the enchanted loom. A piece of gear can be upgraded up to three times and accepts level one, two, or three traits. The higher the upgrade or the better the trait, the rarer the material required. The materials needed to use the enchanted loom are gathered from rescuing, and befriending different kinds of magical creatures out in the world. Once you rescue a creature, it is transported back to the vivarium in your room of requirement where you can feed it or groom it and it will automatically give up its materials once both needs are met. Gathering materials from creatures has a cooldown, so it's best you don't waste any materials you get or just stockpile them until you feel like you have to upgrade a piece of gear. As far as bugs, glitches, or general issues, I really don't have many to speak of. PC players may see some stuttering from time to time, usually at times when you absolutely cannot afford to have less FPS, and there may be the odd texture or model glitch every now and then, but not frequently enough to cause concern or put you off of playing the game. Being able to experience the wizarding world like this is a lot of fun, 
and definitely worth the time of anyone who's even remotely interested in the game. As I said earlier, I'm not what you'd call a Harry Potter fan, but I've been playing this game for 43 hours already, and I don't think I'm going to stop anytime soon. One thing I didn't realize until sitting down to write all this is that Hogwarts Legacy is a full game that delivered on everything that was promised, and that is, unfortunately, a rare thing nowadays. To Harry Potter fans that may be curious, Quidditch is not a currently available game mode, and may never be. That fact was made clear ahead of the game's launch. It was also announced by Headmaster Black after the sorting ceremony. Oh, and one more thing. Due to the unfortunate injury on the pitch in last spring's final, this year's Quidditch season has been cancelled. After giving it some thought, it's kind of clear why. Quidditch is a high-profile event in the Harry Potter movies, so the majority of players would probably want to play it. The broom flight controls are just solid enough to get you from place to place, so there's no guarantee they would hold up in a stressful competition like Quidditch. Doubly so if it had to be played in PvP. People would most likely use their negative experience in that one game mode to unfairly judge the rest of this amazing experience. I could go on, but I have ne'er-do-wells to atomize. Well, I suppose I should be going. I'm anxious to see my brother, who must be elated to have his feet back. Of course, I certainly would be. If you're done hearing me talk, Hogwarts Legacy is available now on PC, the Playstations, the Xboxes, and, surprisingly, the Nintendo Switch. It is a game that's well worth your time. And speaking of time, excuse me while I go sink more of it into this game. If you've enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more. This has been your professor, Cygnus Jason, and you are dismissed.